I'm uh, Stephen Aaron, uh, and as the chair of the UCLA History Department, I am honored uh, to convene this celebration of the life and legacy of Professor Damodar Sardesai, or as most of in this room knew him, Bala. Uh, as I look over the biography of Professor Sardesai, which we've included here in the uh, in this uh, program for today. Um, as I look over the biography, I'm tempted to try to distill it down to a set of numbers. Uh, the number of books he authored and edited, which I think is 17, but I could be, my count could be wrong. Uh, and the number of editions several of those books went through. The number of languages into which these publications were translated the number of dollars he raised in support of the university's programs in South and Southeast Asian studies, the number of doctoral committees he chaired uh, or served on, the number of students he taught, and that one I couldn't begin to calculate. It goes far beyond my numerical capacities. Uh, the number of, well, I guess, the number that most stands out for me uh, is 50 which is the number of years that Bala was formally affiliated with UCLA. That half century began when he arrived as a graduate student in 1961. That phase ended in 1965, uh, which no student anymore finishes their PhD in that amount of time. So I, I, one thing to know is how that occurred, because we could bottle that, we'd be ahead of the game. Uh, in any case, uh, then his appointment uh, as an assistant professor in the department commenced in 1966. He was promoted three years later, something else that doesn't happen anymore, uh, to associate professor. In 1977, he became a full professor. In 1998, he became the inaugural holder of the Doshi professorship, which he retained until his retirement in 2001. Along the way came numerous honors, actually far too numerous for me to list, uh, including, I should say, the, his election as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society of Great Britain, fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Haynes Foundation, the Warmel, Watermill Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as invitations to lecture here and abroad, again, far too numerous for me to speak about in detail here. His service to the university and to other universities in India, um, no less merits our, our admiration. And his teaching of lecture courses and seminars, which I should add continued for 10 years after his retirement as an emeritus professor on recall, inspired, as I mentioned, so many thousands and thousands of students. I know at B.B. Dillon, our chief uh, administrative officer, and I were talking recently when we were looking over our summer session enrollments that our summer session has never recovered uh, from the loss of Professor Sardesai's classes, which used to fill our summer enrollments in ways that we seem not able to duplicate anymore. Um, at any rate, uh, I don't pretend to have the knowledge of Professor Sardesai's life uh, or, the, uh, uh, or the understanding fully of what he has done and did for UCLA. We're very fortunate, though, to have here as speakers some of those whom Professor Sardesai taught and mentored, as well as those who knew him as a colleague and a friend through his five decades at UCLA, and whose remembrances, I believe, will move us well beyond the numbers that I've just sort of spoken to, to attest to his kindness, his generosity, his good humor, his eminence, his intelligence. That is, will attest to his being a life very much worth celebrating. So I want to now turn it over to the first of those speakers. And I guess we will go in the order. No? Oh, where's Je Jeffrey? Oh. No, no, no. I, it's not. no Je Jeffrey? Jeffrey. Who, who better? 
who better to start us off than Jeffrey Simcox, who was Professor Sardesai's colleague through many of those 50 years. Jeffrey Simcox. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, it's an honor to be asked to talk about Bala. Uh, Bala and I started out together um, back in the Paleolithic age. Uh, I arrived as a graduate student, fresh from England, in 1962. And <coughs> it was a very, shall we say, um, odd experience. I felt as though I had just parachuted in from Mars. And um, I was assigned to teach something I had never heard of or imagined, which was Western civilization. Uh, under the reigning monarch of Western civilization at the time, Albert Hoxie, who would uh, um, parade up and down, uh, speaking extempore cigarette in hand, and wowing the hundreds of students in front of him. Bala and I were TAs together for Albert Hoxie. And we were placed, Bala and I were placed together in an office in Royce Hall, in the far end of Royce Hall, um, with a third roommate, a third study mate, um, Brian O'Farrell, who was an Irishman from Liverpool. And the wags in the department said, hmm, all the relics of empire have been gathered together. <laughs> uh, well, it didn't work out quite like that. But what struck me when I <clears throat> arrived was it was Bala. Uh, we didn't, I didn't call him Bala at the time. Um, and he was this small, diminutive man uh, with a, a smile sitting behind his desk, and I sat opposite him. And I was amazed by his, the, the, his equanimity. He, he, he took everything in his stride. Uh, all the bizarre questions of students, all the oddities of teaching at this portmanteau course, he took in his stride. And he actually helped me in the very brutal process of adjustment though, though that first uh, year. Uh, <clears throat> the irony of Bala being called upon to teach Western civilization didn't fully occur to me until later I came across Gandhi's comment when asked about what did he think of Western civilization, and he said he thought it would be a good idea. And uh, the idea, only in retrospect, the irony of Bala doing Western civilization occurred to me. But um, anyway, um, he, our discussions hinged on the on how to keep up with Albert Hoxie, on how to deal with students, on how to manage classes and so on. But principally, they centered on the subject of tea. Uh, O'Farrell was, being a Liverpool Irishman, was uh, a, a, a hearty tea drinker. I was uh, a, an enthusiastic tea drinker, and Bala, of course, was too. So we would discuss uh, the tea in our respective areas. and. We all preferred good, strong tea with milk and sugar. And Bala regaled us with tales of tea he had drunk in railway stations in India and swore that this was the very best and that uh, he, you, you needed something solid to keep you going for the day. And so periodically we would brew up tea and uh, discuss it. And uh, so tea was a, a bond between us. Uh, so. Bala helped me very much through the first few, uh, first year or so of adjustment to this, uh, at the time, very bizarre place. And uh, I am grateful to him for his friendship. I'm grateful to him for his humor. I'm grateful, uh, he had a very wry, as you all know, he had a very wry and ironic way of looking at the world. And that helped too. And, <coughs> 
In fact, he was one of the, 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 the best contacts I had in that first year uh, or so. Uh, later on, we went our separate ways. He went off to do great things in South Asian history. I went off and did uh, other things. Um, and, but we kept in touch. I remember when his daughters were born and he was very pleased about this and he instructed me that I should refer to them as the Raj Kumaris. And uh, we kept in touch, but it wasn't quite like that first year. However, there's one memory that I must still share with you, and that was in the first year or so. Uh, he invited me over to dinner, and Banu cooked, and it was wonderful. And I hadn't had Indian food since leaving England, and it was an experience whose memory still stays with me today, and it's part of the wonderful impression and friendship with Bala in those early days, back when the dinosaurs roamed the campus. Now, I yield the floor. So, I guess we had Jeffrey here speaking about uh, the days as a graduate student with Professor Sardesai. Uh, next, we'll hear from one of his graduate students, uh, one of his many, many, many graduate students, uh, Dr. Arnold Kaminsky. Professor Sardisai was an extraordinary individual. That's quite a bit of an understatement, of course. He used to say that one has at least four gurus in life, uh, and I like to think that he certainly represented all the dimensions those teachers should. He was, gave us a good sound academic education, a good moral direction, and ethic guid ethical guidance, uh, and just a general demeanor that he he represented that we should follow in, in life. Well, I might add that, that I came to UCLA shortly after uh, Simcox, uh, 1965. It was a pretty auspicious year. UDI in Rhodesia, Watts riots, um, this, that, and the other thing happening. And, and of course, for years I persisted with the idea that Pauley Pavilion was built for me, not Lou Alcindor. And, and finally was dispelled of that once he became a pro. But um, Sardisai was unique. He came to work with Stanley Wolpert. Uh, we often talked uh, to, about Stanley as our mentor because he, he, we, he was for both of us. And he was a unique individual. He already was published, already had a reputation for good scholarship and administrative ability when he was in India uh, at the University of Bombay. And he came here and that is possibly why he took just a few years to knock off his dissertation. Interestingly enough, uh, if I recall the story, Stanley tried to urge him to work on Goa, and uh, instead he wrote a two-volume two volume dissertation <laughs> on Indian relations with uh, Southeast Asia, which later turned into a book. One of the first reviewers of that book, I remember, said he suffered from footnote-itis. Which is interesting because in, in uh, one of our first graduate seminars on Southeast Asia, uh, I was pleased to be in there with Zeb Yaroslavsky. And since Charlotte Spence, the Indo-Pacific bibliographer, had just purchased the reel of the Dufferin papers, uh, he and I ended up working on the Third Anglo-Burmese War. While Brian Jenkins from RAND, who later became an anti-terrorism expert on CNN all over the place, worked on Cambodian insurgency in 1970. Uh, Charles Wilson from the Naval Intelligence Unit was in there. These guys had no footnotes. And when we quizzically you know, challenged Sardisai to say, you know, how come we're not slogging away with, with these footnotes and style and citations, and they have none, he would simply hold up his hand like the Buddha and say, rest assured, I've seen them and it's not a problem. It didn't appease us very much. I mean, we were still kind of aggrieved that these guys got a special uh, status, but nevertheless, that shows you the quality of, of the seminars that he proffered during his 50 years. Uh, he was remarkably passionate about India. He was also very uh, measured in the way he articulated uh, things upon which he'd be critical. The one exception was the Portuguese. Uh, in the 
you know, he's all know he came from Goa when it was a Portuguese colony. Uh, he would proudly show you the lati marks, the scars on his legs, if you would ask him to, for for which he was honored by both the governments of Goa and Maharashtra. But uh, in the very first edition, which was published in India, of Southeast Asia, Past and Present, uh, the subsequent six editions have been published by Westview. Uh, he had a phrase in there in the beginning referring to the Portuguese. Uh, he said they smelled because they ate, ate meat and drank and didn't bathe very much. His last edition was a little more moderate. He says the Portuguese were unique. <laughs> and that's the one concession he made to the Portuguese, uh, think, thinking back. I speak for all of my colleagues, my graduate student, fellow graduate students. We were all extraordinarily, luck extraordinarily lucky to have Stanley Wolpert and Sardi Sai and John Galbraith on our committee. And, and uh, Dick Sisson was often there as an ancillary field. And for us, uh, it remains one of the stellar committees that, that has formed at UCLA. Now, I'm sure every graduate student feels his or her committee is, is, is that good, but ours was just a little better, we think. And, and all of our work was highly integrated among the fields, and I think we're located all over the country, from Hawaii to the East Coast. We have a lot of chairs, directors, deans, university presidents, uh, all in our cohort, and, and we just thank UCLA for the training and, and the opportunity to work with Sardi Sai and his colleagues. Um, he was, in the vernacular, a mensch. He really was a thoughtful, caring human being. Uh, one of the things he did for me was quite remarkable. I was to proctor a 150 students in a British Empire exam in 1976 on March 27th, the day that UCLA lost in the semifinals of the NCAA playoffs to Indiana. And I called and I said, I can't make it. My wife is going into labor with our first child. And with his wry sense of humor, he said, well, if I must, I will go cover the exam and don't worry about it. And that little boy uh, now is turned 40 and has nine children of his own. So uh, we have indeed come a long way. My condolences to the family, my appreciation to the family. Banu and, and Bala were, were tremendous partners in life. He used to tell me on the side that Banu never talked to him the first five years they were married, and then add with his little wry smile that she has been making up for false time ever since. But he was extraordinarily uh, uh, gifted in his humanity. He was an example par excellence of humanitas. And for that, we all stand in awe of him. And if you get a chance to look at all the tributes that have come in from his former students, uh, we remain indebted to him and will so all of our lives. Thank you. Our next speaker is another student of Professor Sardesai's, and another student who credits Professor Sardesai with uh, the subsequent decisions he has made. Uh, it's true, he wandered away from history for a few years there and did some other things, but we're happy to report that he's come back now and is uh, teaching a course in the history department to really validate the whole thing. Zev Yaroslavsky. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I want to just give you a little biographical story of how I came to intersect with uh, Professor Sardesai and how, how it changed my life. I don't do this to give you my biography, but I just want you to see how these little encounters can change a, a young man's trajectory in the most fundamental way. Uh, I was raised uh, for the first eight years of my life in, in Boyle Heights. And uh, then we moved to the Fairfax area, where I went to Fairfax High School. And I was a math and science major at Fairfax High School. I was on a trajectory to go into UC to UCLA. That was my hope uh, as a uh, math or, sci or engineering major. Uh, I had no idea what engineering was. I was even interested a little bit in meteorology, because my dad had a friend who was the chairman of the meteorology department here. Uh, and. Uh, 
Uh, and so I went through from elementary school, late elementary school, all the way through high school in a class of students of about 25 or 30 students, all of whom stuck together for all those years. One of those students was a young Chinese-American uh, kid by the name of Raymond Lee. Raymond had this capacity to, uh, when, when you put a four-digit number on the blackboard and multiply it by another four-digit number, he could give you the answer without computing it. He was uh, so smart that the teachers isolated him uh, to uh, dissuade us from cheating off of his paper. When I was admitted to UCLA as a mathematics major, I went to my first calculus class over here on the south side of the campus, and I walked into a lecture hall of about 300 students there, and about a third of them all looked like Raymond Lee. And I said, I can't compete with this. I'm out of here. One lecture and I was done. And I decided I would apply my mathematical prowess, whatever that was, with my interest in social sciences, and I became an economics major. And uh, for about a year and a quarter, four quarters, uh, I dutifully took e economics. And then with the war in Vietnam raging and campus raging as well, I decided, uh, uh, I saw in the catalog a class, I think it was History 196A, a History of Southeast Asia, being offered by a Mr. Sardesai. And I said, you know, I think I'll take that. It's an elective, I don't have to, not every class I take has to be economics. So I took this course because I figured if I took this course, I could know just enough to be dangerous on the campus at Meyerhoff Park and lend my opinions on the war in Vietnam. And I came to the class, it was in Haynes Hall, there were about 75 students in this class. And uh, Mr. Sardesai uh, came to the lectern and he said the following. He said, this is history 196A. It is the history of Southeast Asia from prehistoric times to the 10th century. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, <laughs> what have I done? This is not what I had in mind. And, but I'm not gonna get up and leave the course, uh, leave the class, the professor is speaking, and I said, I'll suck it up for 50 minutes and hear what he has to say. And those 50 minutes uh, really uh, changed my life in a very profound way. I'd never had a teacher uh, who taught history uh, and brought it to life the way he did. And my father was, among other things, a history teacher, and I was required to take his classes in Hebrew school. And I will just say he was not as charismatic as uh, <laughs> Professor Sardesai. And neither were any of my high school history teachers. And I figured if this guy can make prehistoric Southeast Asian history interesting, just imagine what it'll be like when we get to the 19th and 20th century. And so I took 196B, and I took 196C, which was the one I had intended to take in the first place. I didn't know there was a difference between A and C. And in those days, I don't know what it's like now, but in those days, if you had three upper division history classes, you were a third of the way to a history major. You needed nine upper division classes and a couple of lower division classes. And I did the math, applied my mathematic prowess, and figured I'm gonna be a dual major. And, uh, and I declared as a, uh, not just as an econ major, but also as a history major. And uh, I think I, by my calculation, I took five, five or six courses from Professor Sardesai. And uh, uh, some in British imperial history, uh, most of in Southeast Asian history. And, uh, uh, and I got to know him, uh, you know, as a student would, would get to know uh, his, his teacher. And uh, there wasn't ever a time when I had a class with him that I didn't look forward to going to the class. Like you'd look forward to going to see a play that had been well reviewed. Uh, this guy knew how to talk, he knew how to teach. He knew how to motivate his students. And uh, one of the seminars, I don't think it was the one that Kaminsky and I had together, it was a subsequent one, uh, was conducted in his office on the sixth or seventh floor of Bunch Hall. And uh, in those days, some of you may be old enough to remember that in those days you could smoke anywhere on this campus. You could smoke in class. They had, instead of inkwells, they had ashtrays. And in the libraries, every cubicle had, a, uh, had an ashtray. And I was a two-pack-a-day smoker in those days. And, uh, and I walked into uh, the first session in Professor Sardesai's office. There were four, four or five other students. And I took out a Marlboro, and I lit it up, and I started smoking. And Professor Sardesai turned to me, and he said, Mr. Yaroslavsky, would you please open the window? 
And I said, Professor Sardesai, the windows in Bunch Hall don't open. And he said, ah, oh, then why don't you do the next best thing? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the, the first time uh, that I recall uh, ever being conscious of the fact that uh, what we now call, and have for years called, secondhand smoke. I didn't realize that my smoking, I knew that it was doing something to my lungs. It didn't occur to me that it might be uh, discomforting uh, my neighbors in, in a class. And I uh, never again smoked in his office, of course, and I also never again smoked in class, although I did continue to smoke in the library. Um, and uh, uh, it was his, yeah, his wry sense of humor uh, and, his, and his Indian wisdom uh, and, the, and the way he went about it uh, that, uh, that still stays with me the rest, uh, has stayed with me for the rest of my life. A uh, couple of other things I want to say uh, about Professor Sardesai. When I, he convinced me to come to go to graduate school. That was the reason. He was the reason I went to, to graduate school. I entered the doctoral program, and uh, almost as soon as I entered the doctoral program, I realized this <laughs> this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. Uh, researching colonial office minutes was not exactly uh, as interesting to me as it was uh, in earlier years, um, and so I had a considerable amount of extracurricular activity in those days. Uh, civil disobedience on campus against the war, uh, and in my activities on behalf of human rights behind the Iron Curtain, I got arrested one day disturbing the peace at the Shrine Auditorium. And my picture appeared on page three of the LA Times one Monday morning being led out of the Shrine Auditorium in handcuffs. And I was identified in the caption. Well, Professor Galbraith, who was my, uh, would have been my doctoral chairman, uh, called me into his office. And, uh, I was always very intimidated by Galbraith. I, I don't know why. Uh, well, I do know why. He was very intimidating. He was very quiet. You never knew quite what he was thinking. Sardesai, you knew what he was thinking. He was an extrovert. Uh, Galbraith was more introverted. But he said the following, words that have stayed with me uh, since that moment. He said, Mr. Yaroslavsky, when are your academic pursuits going to take at least as much of your, of your time as your extracurricular activities? And it was the moment, I didn't tell him that that was the moment that, at that moment, but that was the moment I decided I'm out of here. I'm going to go out and save the world, and I'm not going to save it in the research library. And uh, Sardesai, on the other hand, when I told him that I was going to leave, I was going to pick up my master's. In those days, you picked it up on your way to your PhD. Uh, and in June of 1972, I was going to leave, and I was going to go work in, on a presidential campaign, the McGovern for President campaign. Um, I was in charge of the Jewish vote in California. I delivered my vote. <laughs> but uh, Sardesai was thrilled. He, he got it right away because uh, I, I discussed politics with him over the years, both as a student and later on. And, and uh, uh, I think it's safe to say that he was a political animal in his own way. He followed politics. He followed, of course, international politics. and. Indian politics and Southeast Asian politics, but he also followed American politics and local politics. And he could see that there was a fire burning in me uh, and I had to get out into the real world and, and do, do my thing. And he was very encouraging. Uh, when I got elected to the city council uh, in 1975, uh, I, I, I was, one of my great disappointments before that was that I had disappointed Professor Galbraith. I, I thought I had let him down and, and the university and the whole establishment. But I got a note from Professor Galbraith that said, Dear Mr. Yaroslavsky, congratulations on your election to the City Council of Los Angeles. Uh, I hope the city of Los Angeles is in better shape today than the empire is. And, uh, and that, that kind of got me off the, off the hook. Uh, but Professor Sardesai remained in touch with me uh, over the years. I remember, and Barbara and I remember, when Mrs. Sardesai took us to an Indian restaurant on La Cienega Boulevard, I remember it like it was yesterday, it was a feast. And, uh, and, and Professor Sardesai introduced me to, to uh, that aspect of Indian culture. The other thing I want to say is that uh, Professor Sardesai was the first Indian I had ever met. I lived a pretty sheltered life. I grew up with Mexican Americans and, and uh, Japanese Americans in Boyle Heights. Uh, I grew up with Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, and Conservative Jews in the Fairfax area. That was diversity uh, for me. Um, I'd never met an Indian until I met him. 
And I learned so much uh, about Indian culture uh, from him and uh, uh, in, in the conversations we had about so the, the war in Southeast Asia uh, and uh, in politics and American politics and how it was influencing the war and the, the whole nine yards. Uh, I never had a conversation with him which, uh, which I didn't find uh, meaningful. So in the end, uh, and this is the end of my uh, comment, uh, the one thing he taught me that has lasted with me uh, for the rest of my life is, is uh, how to look at history and to see history not just as a series of individual disconnected events, but to kind of look at the picture, uh, the, the bigger picture, what was happening in the world in 1872. What was the impact of the invention of the telegraph on policies in the Straits of Malacca when the, uh, tele as a result of the telegraph, as a result of communication being instantaneous as opposed to months at a time? Uh, what were the ebbs and flows of, of uh, not just British policy, but French and German? And you know, how, did that, how did that impact what was happening often in the far reaches? And, uh, and to walk a mile in the shoes of the protagonist that you're, you're uh, writing about and you're studying about. Don't just see it from your own perspective, but try to see it from their perspective. And uh, uh, that was a lesson that uh, took me a long way uh, in, in my political career because as I've often said, Steve and I have talked about it, uh, history, 90% you know, of the history students never become history professors and never become history teachers. They become lawyers, politicians, businessmen. History is the type O blood. It, it can apply to any walk of life other than the rarefied sciences, but it's the, the lessons you learn from history can be applied in any walk of life. And the lessons he taught me, because he was the person who I studied with more than any other single professor here on campus, the lessons he taught me uh, stood me in good stead for many years uh, and decades to come. So yeah. Uh, Thank you, Mrs. Sardesai and the Sardesai family for sharing, uh, uh, P Professor Sardesai, I never called him Bala. Uh, uh, he'll always be Professor Sardesai to me. Thank you for sharing him uh, with me and with the thousands of other students who he impacted. Uh, I will miss him, uh, but his legacy, uh, his legacy carries on in his students, and uh, he has so many of them. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you've heard from some of them today, uh, and there are thousands of them uh, roaming the globe doing their thing. So uh, it's been my privilege uh, to have been touched with him, and I'm glad I made the decision to take History 196A. Uh, it, it changed my life. Thank you, Zav. I plan to steal that type O bloodline. That, that's a good one. That's a good one. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to... Chairs have almost no authority at UCLA, but I'm going to exercise what little authority chairs I have, what little authority chairs do have, by I'm going to reverse the order of our last two speakers. Uh, so I'm going to ask Paul Padilla, longtime undergraduate advisor in the history department, to speak next. Paul. Much has been said about uh, Bala's uh, work as an advisor, an administrator, and a, a scholar, and all of it well-deserved. Uh, I come today to you to speak uh, uh, briefly about Bala, the teacher, which is how I knew him best. Uh, he was um, uh, quite a... Well, let me t say something that, and I'm sure uh, Banu has, said, has heard this many times. Bala used to always say that UCLA had many great scholars, but they didn't have enough good teachers. Now, that's not that we had an overabundance of bad teachers. It's that uh, Bala cared about his students, and he cared about UCLA, and he felt that we sh should have more good teachers, and he certainly was a good teacher. Um, uh, I believe that his primary interest, uh, in spite of all his achievements, was instilling knowledge in students. I dare say he enjoyed giving them 
knowledge as much as they enjoyed learning from him. Uh, and uh, he last taught for us in summer of 2011. And uh, later that fall, he called me back to say that he would uh, no longer be teaching for us because of health problems. He had uh, been uh, told by his doctor, his wife, his two daughters, that uh, the time has come. Now, two years earlier, Bala had called me and told me the same thing. Uh, he had had some health issues, and he said, you know, this, is, I think, is the last time I'll be able to teach. And I said, you had a wonderful run. <coughs> I understand. A job well done, and uh, you know, we'll let it go. He called me a couple weeks later to say he had had a change of heart. And could he be signed up to teach ancient India and uh, the first part of British Empire for the following summer? And I said, certainly. He was giggly as a schoolboy. Now, the reason is I think he actually thought that we didn't want him back. As uh, Stephen said, he brought in a lot of our enrollments uh, in the summer. And I sort of just, uh, whew, he's back, good. And everyone else was happy that he was back. But he, I think, actually thought that we didn't want him anymore. Uh, and now I wish I had told him that, no, it wasn't uh, the case. Um, now, during the summers when he taught, he and I would regularly have lunch, of course, always at an Indian restaurant. Uh, and uh, I, just about every Indian restaurant, up and down Wilshire, up and down Westwood, on Pico, wherever there was one, Bala knew them all, and we would always have lunch at a different Indian restaurant. Uh, now, uh, I enjoyed Bala's sense of humor. He was a witty man. Uh, he, when he was chair, which is one of the times when I first got to know him, and I was just starting my graduate sc uh, school years then, uh, we had a slow day in the uh, interim period between the quarters, and we had an undergraduate uh, student worker who was doing imitations of the faculty. Great imitations. And uh, Bala was the chair at the time. He goes out the chair's office because he hears all these people laughing. He wants to know what's going on. If it's a good time, he wants to be involved in it. So he comes out, and we see him standing at the door with that wicked smile of his and the glitter in his eye, and he's nodding his head, and we try to tell Lewis. And finally, he turns around to see what's going on, and you, uh, Professor Sardesai, now Bala looks at him, he's clapping. I like this very much. I like to do more, do more, do more. <laughs> and uh, so Lewis did a few more, and uh, a couple weeks later, Bala and I are having lunch, and he says, do you remember what Lewis did a couple of weeks ago? I said, oh, I don't think any in, uh, insult was intended about it. No, 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 I like this very much. But I like his imitation of Jeffrey Simcox. That was excellent. <laughs> I mean, there was a wickedness to the man that was just so enjoyable. Uh, you know, some of his former students. We, you know, one thing about a school like UCLA is that people enjoy their years here, but they forget about us. But every once in a while, someone comes back to visit. And earlier this year, I had a, two students come, and I informed them of Bala's passing. Uh, one of them was quiet for maybe 20 seconds, and then finally he looks at me, he goes, he was one of my favorite teachers. Another one, maybe a month or two later, comes over to me and asks me about Professor Sardesai, and I inform her of his passing, and she fights back the tears and for, and for about a minute, and then finally she comes out and says, he was a nice man. And so say we all. Indeed, he was. And uh, the world is a better place because we have known him, and he has brought much uh, to UCLA, to our undergraduates, um, and I think that is what he enjoyed the most, teaching the, the young people. Uh, thank you. And make a note that we need to find someone to do impersonations of department faculty. Um, 
I, as I said, exercised my chair's authority to switch around the program because I really do think it what is most appropriate that our last speaker uh, today is Stanley Wolper, who has obviously known uh, Professor Sardesai for a long, long time as his mentor, as his colleague, and as his friend, Stanley Wolper. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Banu, Brendan. All of you have heard how great a scholar and teacher and human being Bala was. And all of you now are aware of the loss we have sustained since his death. Bala was my first doctoral candidate who completed his work under my chairmanship. He had come to UCLA <coughs> from Bombay and Pune from Maharashtra in 1961, Dorothy and I had come here three years earlier, I to teach and introduce the history of India. And when Bullock came to my office the first time, he said that he would like me to chair his doctoral committee uh, because he was keen to get his PhD. I think he really, at the time, wanted to be a diplomat. He probably wanted to become prime minister and certainly could have done a better job for India than half of the prime ministers who followed Nehru. But uh, that was not in the cards. And... Uh, so I said, well, I think it, it would be uh, a very good thing for you to become a doctor of history, and I'm sure that you'll become a very good one. But you know, uh, we have at this point in, uh, in the department a much more senior person than myself. I just came to UCLA. And Professor Galbraith, who teaches British Empire, uh, is a man who uh, you might want to have as your chair because then he would be sure to get you a job when you graduated, and jobs was scarce at the time. And Butler thought about that, and he said, you know, you, you have been to uh, Pune. Uh, Dorothy and I had just come back from there, and." I had been there as a uh, Ford Fellow for a year and was completing my uh, work on Tillich and Gokhale. And he said, and you have worked on, on the two leaders of Indian nationalism who I personally have always uh, thought about and, and wanted to write about. There were few people I met in Pune who were not about to write a book on either Tilak or Gokhale, so when they heard that I was doing both, I think they, they got very excited. He said, I want to work with you. I said, well, that's, that's a great honor for me, and uh, thank you. I'd be happy to do that. And any time I can help you, just come in, and we will discuss any problem that you may have. And he would start to come to see me <coughs> every week. And he would sit in the office and show me what he had written or discuss about what he had read, you know, the tutorial method of Cambridge and Oxford. And I would either make a few technical or, or minor corrections in what he had written or suggest that he read something else. And after that, we would go to lunch.
Steve had trouble remembering or, or noting how many students Bella had. I can't remember how many lunches I had. <laughs> Here in this building, we came every week. He'd come to my office first. Then we'd walk over and we'd, we'd order our lunch. And then we'd go into the Cal uh, room next to this California room, which had two very soft couches that, that were like the uh, couches that a Maharaja would sit on. And we would sit there and we would solve or discuss the problems of the world. Had nothing to do then with what he was studying or reading. It had to do with uh, global mm -hmm. politics, how to resolve the Vietnam War. So we launched the first uh, major sit-in on Vietnam from the history department here at UCLA. And Bala was one of the speakers and I was another. And we called for an end to a war that had Marine captains explaining to the world that they had to destroy a village in order to save it. Almost as stupid as some of the things we hear today from the Republican Party. And Bala and I discussed politics, of course. And Bala was the thing that I really liked as much about Bala as his sense of humor and his mind, which was a brilliant mind. I said he was my first graduate student. I think in many ways he was my best. Was that he was a liberal, though he was born a Brahmin. He was born at the top of the line for India's social hierarchy. And the Brahmins, you know, were considered twice born and were supposed to obey the rules and regulations of the Rig Veda and all the other <coughs> textbooks of Hindu society. And Bala yet became not only a liberal, but something of an outcast lover. He appreciated more than any Indian I have ever met the struggle that Gandhiji led against untouchability. One of his heroes, he had three heroes really in history. Shivaji, who was the leader of the Maharashtrian rebellion against British rule and against Mughal imperial rule and about whom he wrote in the encyclopedia for me. And Nehru, who was India's first prime minister and one of Bala's heroes. But the third person was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. He was born untouchable and he was chosen by Nehru to be his minister of education and law and he was the chairman of the Constitution of India and Bala admired him enormously. And I said to him once, why don't you write about Ambedkar? And he said, well, he said, you know Guru Dave, he called me that. He said, you always tell me what I should write, but I have so many books that you've told me, I can't do them all. I have to do one at a time. And I must first work on Goa, <coughs> and I must first work on Maharashtra, and I can't just jump into I'm bad guy. I said, all right, all right. What we will have to do then is solve the problems one at a time. And so we went back to discussing American politics. And you may recall, Zev, that when Eisenhower was elected president, at one point, Shimon Peres said that there were gaps in his ignorance. <laughs> and and Bala appreciated the fact that the Republican Party seemed to have a proclivity to put 
the most implausible people into positions of great power. And he and I would sit in this faculty center next door and we would get so excited about the fact that a second-rate actor, for example, like Ronald Reagan, could aspire to become governor of California. Can you imagine? Governor of California, we laughed. Bala and I, we said, he'll never make it. <laughs> Soon he ran for president. <laughs> and when he ran for president, we cried. And then we said, now the bottom of the pit has been reached. But suddenly, Nixon appeared. And Bala, of course, like myself, felt that tricky Dick Nixon was going to destroy not only Bangladesh with its genocide, but also as much of the world as he could by bringing the Seventh Fleet into the Indian Ocean, which had nuclear weapons. And so then, India armed itself with nuclear weapons. And Nixon, of course, had as his advisor on all these political issues, Kissinger. And Bala would look at me and I would look at him and he would say, what is a Kissinger? And I would say, it is a very bad sort of creature, Bala. And there was very little that we could do about thinking that we had suddenly reached a new low a low that nobody believed was possible in this country until George Bush came along. And when George Bush came along, we said, now we are at the bottom of the pit. And Bala said, what will happen to the world when a man so stupid can steal not only one election but two and put the world in a state of shock and war. And in a sense, I suppose not only am I sad and cry at the thought that he and I have not been able to discuss what has happened to the Republican nomination this year, but I think it's a great tragedy, but a great relief for Bala that he has escaped. What keeps me feeling sorry for the country every day that I see and read about someone who is so much more a television, what, comic or tragedian than a valid candidate for president. And I think of what Balam would say. This Trump, he cannot become president. And I agree with him. But unfortunately, he's not here for me to take to lunch. So we can't have a good time talking about it. The most wonderful thing that I think Bala was proud of was his marriage to Bunham. You know, their marriage crossed caste lines. It was defiant of the most conservative authority of Hindu Brahmins because they were not of even the same region of India, but it was a love marriage. And as Bala said, I could choose nobody but Banu to be my bride, and she was happy to accept me and to have me. And I said, I understand how you feel. And of course, he knew Dorothy because Dorothy invited not only Banu and Bala, but also Vandana every Thanksgiving to our home for dinner. And our children came to think that the idea of having Indians at Thanksgiving meal was a celebration <laughs> of America <laughs> in a slightly different context. Now, 
one thing that Bala was was a gentleman. You know, I think I think you were saying that Paul and and you too, Jeffrey. He was really it was at least ten years before he could call me anything but Professor Walpert. And every time he came to me and every time we had lunch and every time we talked, I kept calling him Bala. And finally I said, you know, I, I have to stop calling you Bala. I'll call you Professor Sergisai, unless you stop calling me Professor Walpert. And that's when he started calling me Guru Dave. Now Guru Dave is a title that Mahatma Gandhi gave to Rabindranath Tagore and I said that is much too exorbitant for me and much too exalted. And he said, no, no, you are my Guru Dave. And then I said, all right, if you call me Guru Dave, I must call you Maharaj. So we became Guru Dave and Maharaj together. We each had titles. We did not exist as named people only. He was four years younger than I was. I always considered him my younger brother. I never had a younger brother, but I miss him. Not as much as you do, Manu, Mandela, but I miss him. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly and Peter, um, in the back there for arranging this uh, wonderful tribute. Uh, thank you to our speakers uh, for their fond remembrances of a cherished teacher, scholar, colleague, citizen of the world, gentleman, and lunch partner. Um, and thank you to the Sardesai family for sharing Professor Sardesai uh, with UCLA for so many years. We are, obviously this institution is so much the richer for that association. So thank you all very, very much. We have a reception uh, outside in which we can sort of further pay tribute to uh, Professor Damodar Sardesai. Thank you all very much.